следующий докладчик. So this our next uh, presenter. So we uh, want to uh, to say you thank you for everything. So just uh, listen to him. He is uh, Pierre Chevalier from. Um, sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, Made Safe Company. So yeah, you can start. Thank you. Uh, hi. Okay. Hi everyone. So I guess I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Pierre Chevalier. I'm the leader of the routing team at MadeSafe, and we build the Safe Network. If you've seen the TV show Silicon Valley, the new internet in the Silicon Valley is actually inspired by what we're doing. Uh, we've been advising them. Uh, so it's a decentralized and encrypted network, and the idea is to try and give the people ownership of the data again. Um, so it's a pretty interesting project in my opinion, but then again, I'm biased. If you're interested in hearing more, I recommend you check our website, safenetwork.tech. Uh, and in this talk, I'm gonna be focused on the consensus aspect of it, which doesn't cover nearly uh, everything, but yeah. So the title for this talk is Blockchain Was Just the Beginning. Uh, I'm going to start by showing a little bit what I would consider were great things that blockchain put on the scene, and then some limitations of it, and then what we can improve uh, based on these limitations, specifically in the consensus area. Uh, so what's, what are the good things about blockchain? Probably most of you are already familiar with them, but technologically, uh, I'd say it's a couple of things that arrive together, civil resilience and consensus, and that allows you to build a distributed ledger that's immutable um, after the fact. Uh, so breaking it down, what's trusted, trustless consensus and what's civil resilience? Uh, civil resilience is about being resilient to civil attacks, and a civil attack is when you create many fake identities to try to subvert a system. Uh, so with, for instance, proof of work, if you created millions and millions of identities, it wouldn't matter because if you don't have the hash power, you just cannot subvert the network. Uh, and then trustless consensus, a way to explain consensus is, say we're all in this room, we're all computers, and we want to agree on the order of something. So we all have a sheet of paper with 10 words in a different order for each of us. And we need to find a way to communicate, and as the outcome of this, we should all together come with a list of 10 words in the correct order. But some of us are malicious and can say any word, can say the words in the order they want, they can repeat, they can try to do a fork, they can do anything malicious to try and prevent everyone to reach consensus. Uh, the trustless bit, so if you just want consensus, it's very easy. Like, you are the leader, you tell us what we do, you just read your list, and we trust you, and that's fine. So, where blockchain uh, introduced something really new, it was, uh, it allowed trustless consensus where you don't need a leader. Everyone, anyone can be malicious, but still, we will collectively arrive to a, to a right answer. So, in the case of blockchain, uh, we're reaching consensus on the order of transactions, and that allows us to do a currency. Uh, at least in the case of a cryptocurrency. So what are other good things about blockchain? Right now I'm more uh, focused on the technical things, which is what I just said, but really it allowed a new kind of currency that we hadn't seen before, where you don't have political control of the currency. Uh, it's just the rules and people follow the rules. You can't block someone, you can't uh, issue more currency, possibly created hyperinflation or anything. Um, and also with blockchain, you can do much more than just a currency. Uh, there have been many explorations. You can do peer-to-peer -peer lending. You can do su supply chain tracking uh, and another variety of uh, applications. So basically, blockchain has kind of been a transformational uh, technological breakthrough because of its impact on uh, society because of what it represents for people. Uh, so to sum up this part about the good sides of blockchain, it was 
a new technological concept that we didn't have before and that served as a proof of concept to show the appetite for trustless consensus, decentralized systems, and a way to not rely on institutions to tell us what to do, but instead rely on algorithms. Now, of course, technology is never all white or all black. There is always some trade-offs. So what are the things in blockchain that could be done better? Um, so quick disclaimer, most of what's wrong with blockchain is actually what's wrong around blockchain and in the way people use it. Uh, the math is pretty solid, uh, but yet there are some technical limitations, and so I'll cover them. They're the ones that interest me the most. Uh, in terms of growing pains, there is facts that, uh, for instance, there is low adoption at the moment. The markets are unregulated. You have very shady behavior of people influencing the markets, uh, like whales and such things, uh, which create high volatility. And so there are like things that could be resolved maybe over the next couple of decades. Uh, same kind of things with lack of regulation that could just be improved in a couple of decades when the regulators catch up. Uh, and then you can have maybe some consumer protection. Uh, humans are terrible at security. Like, you can give them the best technology, they will misuse it. So, in particular, humans are very bad at keeping a private key private and secure. And the entire concept of blockchain relies on you being careful with your private key. So, if you lose it, you've lost your money. If someone puts a kilogram on your machine and you type your key, you've lost your money. You need to be careful. If you put your money on, a, on an exchange that's centralized, these guys have your wallet, you're not having the money. So you're really missing the point because you don't trust a bank because they own your money and could do anything with it, but then you're just giving it to some random guy on the internet without any regulation. You have uh, proof that there have been so many hacks and so many uh, loss of money in exchanges, and yet you kind of trust these guys for some reason, like it completely breaks the entire concept. So there is no point in having a very secure blockchain if you don't go full on board on decentralization. So these two first point, growing pains and like humans are terrible. I think over the next few decades, these things can improve, humans can be educated, software can be made more intuitive, you can have maybe a raise of uh, decentralized exchanges, etc. Uh, but really what interests me is technical limitations of blockchains. Because these, I don't think we need to wait a couple of decades for things to fix themselves. I think we can do something now. Uh, so in blockchain, at least in proof of work, which is what I'm, it's mostly the scope of what I'm describing here, uh, the entire premise is that you're going to burn electricity to prove that you're not uh, well, to prove that you're invested, and this is how you'll gain security. So in principle, it kind of makes sense, because if you assume an efficient market, people won't burn more electricity than the value produced by securing the transactions. Now, there are two premises to this that I would question. One is efficient markets, I think they're a myth. And two is you're assuming there isn't a better way to do security without burning all that energy. Uh, so, yeah, I think we can do better, and I'll uh, cover this in this talk. Uh, okay, that's not necessarily something that blockchain is not doing on purpose, but people tend to think of it as anonymous, at least if you read some forums, people tend to have that expectation. It's not the case. All the transactions are publicly visible on a ledger for everyone to see. So at best, it's pseudonymous. And if you give a picture of your passport because of know your customer regulations or something, you should really not expect privacy. Like, people can track everything you're doing, so just be aware of it. Uh, another couple of um, things where I think blockchain hits the mark, uh, doesn't hit the mark, it tries to be decentralized, but the incentives are such that it causes centralization. You, as a loan miner with your little ASIC, nowadays are not going to find a block. So you kind of have to be in a pool. But then if you have about, like, the couple biggest pools, 
have about 30% of the hash rate and 20% of the hash rate, then they just need to collude and you can do a 51% attack. And so from being something that's like someone would never muster 51% of the hash rate and that's the whole basis of security, it becomes much more credible that you could pressure the 10 individuals that are running the two pools into colluding and uh, doing a 51% attack. So yeah, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and there is that other problem of centralization of projects. If you had many competing projects all trying to do their own blockchain that's proof of work based, like it's actually a little bit the case. Um, now, if one of the project has much more hashing power than everyone else, then they can spend 10 minutes, go do a 51% attack into another project, and if that's more profitable than mining for them, then why wouldn't they do it? It's the incentives, that's how it works. So you kind of are incentivized to consolidate everything into one blockchain which concentrates most of the hash rate on the planet. Or if not, you're going to have people who are credible threats of 51% attacks in two smaller blockchains. And it has happened, like uh, Ethereum Classic or these kind of things, like people just rent server space and uh, or like well re rent hash power and do 51 percent attacks so yeah it's not a design that lends itself to proper decentralization uh, and then there is the problem of inefficiency both in terms of bandwidth and latency uh, so it depends on which blockchain you're looking at but there is the time for the next block and then you probably need to wait a few blocks if you want to be sure that it is actually valid uh, and then there is also the problem of bandwidth where you can, you're can you limited to, say, single digits, max double digits transactions per second. Uh, so the blockchain was a great innovation, but it's not all rosy. Um, some of the problems are human-related or growing pains, and okay, for this, maybe we just need to be patient and wait for the world to adapt. But some of them uh, are coupled to the technical design. It's almost by design. Uh, so maybe for these ones we can improve with a different consensus mechanism. So what can we do better? Well, first of all, I'm not going to solve all the problems. Uh, as I've said, blockchain is fundamentally civil resilience and consensus. And uh, in the safe network, we, have, we are tackling civil resilience and we have solutions for this. Um, these joint sections, no aging resource proof. So if you're interested, I invite you to check our website. Uh, but in this scope, I'm just speaking of consensus. Uh, and so this asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's the mathematical name of the type of protocol we are looking for that replaces part of what blockchain does. And in my opinion, that does a better job uh, so, from the blockchain innovations, we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. We care about the trustless nature. We don't want a leader somewhere. Like, consensus with a leader has existed since decades, and that's what banks use, and it's not innovating. It doesn't bring what we want. Uh, we want it to remain decentralized. We want it to be open source so that people can find bugs and we can benefit from the community-driven security. Uh, and of course, we want it to be as simple as possible. Uh, it doesn't mean stupidly simple, because you do have to solve some problems, but it means hopefully simple enough, I can explain it now and you can understand the intuition behind it. Uh, but of course, if we were just maintaining the status quo of blockchain, there would be no point in inventing a consensus protocol. So what we want that blockchain doesn't give, uh, one is mathematically proven correctness. So in blockchain, you generate the next block. At this moment in time, it's the longest chain. But then you have to wait. And uh, after a certain number of blocks are appended to your blockchain, you can be relatively confident that you've got the longest one so this transaction will, will not be rewritten. Uh, it's always a probabilistic thing, and how long do you wait? And uh, So in our case, once you take a decision, it's final, because the math says so. Uh, we want to be efficient. That's one of the most important aspects of it. 
we want to avoid burning electricity for the sake of it because in 2019 uh, climate change is a worry and electricity can just not be uh, spent like this. Uh, we want to be efficient in terms of latency and bandwidth uh, and then we want to be really decentralized so because we won't have the, the incentives that proof of work gives of colluding and doing a 51% attack, then any number of small projects could use a consensus protocol like the one we have, and there wouldn't be a problem with that. Uh, so I'm not, when I say mathematically proven, I'm not giving the gory details. If you want them, ask me at the end of the talk. Uh, okay, now this is the most uh, probably scary slide in the entire deck, so don't worry, it's just to define what we are doing. Uh, so asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant consensus is the category of mathematical problems we are solving and really it's broken down into two bits, asynchronous and uh, Byzantine fault tolerant. Asynchronous means the messages could take any kind of time to reach each other. So say if we take the example of us reaching consensus on these 10 uh, words on a sheet of paper that we all have, say you have to talk to him, you have to go to the, to the end of the room, it's a slower communication than you talking to your neighbor. Uh, but in addition, because we are saying asynchronous, it's actually even stronger than this, we are saying someone malicious who's trying to subvert the protocol could choose how long it takes for any communication to happen as long as it's finite and yet they should not be able to subvert the consensus. That's the proper definition of asynchronous in, the, in this context. Uh, and when we say Byzantine fault tolerant, it's the one that's the most jargon-like, but really it just means resilient to nodes trying to cause trouble. Uh, it could be just because they're crushed and they're unresponsive, or it could be because they're malicious and actually trying their best to either prevent agreement or cause agreement on something wrong or delay it forever. Uh, okay, so conclusion for this kind of lengthy introduction, we can do better than blockchain using math for the specific ac um, question of consensus. Uh, so now I'm going to present uh, the, the algorithm that I've been introducing with this little thing. Okay, uh, so first of all, what's the setting? Well, you're gonna have at most a third of the nodes being malicious or Byzantine. Uh, sorry for the text being under the, so this renders different from my computer. Um, so here I've, I've put 10 computers, the three red ones which look black on the screen are malicious you cannot have more than a third. And the reason is because there is a mathematical proof that you cannot do ABFT, asynchronous, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, with more than n divided by three uh, malicious nodes. So we're going to stick to this constraint. Now, as I've said before, this does not cover civil resilience, so you have to have your own mechanism to filter whoever is participating in the consensus so that you can guarantee that you won't have more than a third malicious ones. Uh, so now I'm going to put a little definition for you guys. A supermajority is any group of more than two third nodes. And the reason I'm putting this definition is because it's got a couple of interesting properties that will be handy later. Uh, one of them is that if you pick any two supermajorities, they share one honest node. Uh, here I've picked the worst possible case because both supermajorities contain all malicious nodes. That's bad luck. But despite this, because a supermajority, if you call the number of malicious nodes f, uh, a supermajority is going to be 2f plus 1 or more. And so you're going to have f which are the malicious nodes, f which are the nodes that the other supermajority doesn't include, and then you'll have at least one extra node that has to be in the other supermajority. Uh, so keep that in mind for later, it's going to be come in handy. Uh, another interesting property of a supermajority 
is that if you wait long enough, a supermajority of nodes will always be responsive because the only nodes who could be unresponsive forever are the malicious nodes, and they're less than a third, which leaves a supermajority of other nodes which are all correct. Uh, so to sum up this little setting the scene bit, uh, we tolerate less than a third malicious node, and we define the supermajority as more than two thirds of the nodes, which means that two supermajorities will always share at least one honest node, and a supermajority will always eventually be responsive. So now we've done enough setting up. Let's speak about Parsec. It's the consensus protocol that uh, this talk is about. Uh, Parsec stands for a protocol for asynchronous, reliable, secure, and efficient consensus. Uh, you can Google it. It's on GitHub. The, there is a white paper that you can read, which is a bit math heavy, but hopefully I'm giving you the light version here. Uh, so the strategy for Parsec one, we need to communicate information. Two, we need to record that information in some form. Three, looking at the record we've gathered, we'll interpret it, and this will allow us to solve the consensus problem. And this is the little uh, path we'll go together. Uh, so, spoiler alert, I'm spilling the beans. This is the entire thing. We communicate in an efficient and resilient manner by using gossip then we record history of the gossip communications in a gossip graph. Then we interpret this graph by defining a couple of concepts, uh, strongly seen and observer. And having done this, we can solve the problem by reducing from the general problem of ABFT that I've been uh, introducing to the problem of binary consensus which is a simpler problem and which happens to have a very elegant solution already. Okay, so this was the very fast version. Now I'll basically go over each of these four points and go in more details and hopefully everything will be very clear. So communicating. Uh, we communicate through gossip. So there are two properties we want from our communication mechanism. One is to be efficient, i.e not send more messages than needed. And the other one is to be resilient, which means if some nodes are malicious and trying to prevent some of the network from hearing from other participants in the network, they should not be able to do it. Um, so I'll give you two examples of ways to communicate that satisfy one of these two properties, but not both, and then explain why gossip satisfies both. Uh, so Round robin is everyone speaks to their neighbor and communicates information that way. Uh, it's efficient because if you look at it, you send order n messages, which is uh, the entire network sends about as many messages as there are participants in the network. But it's not resilient because the two malicious nodes here, if they just stop communicating, for instance, then the left part of the graph does not know about the right part of the graph. They've succeeded in disrupting the flow of communication. So this is not good enough. Uh, and there is a very easy way to make it resilient. You just say, everyone tells all they know to everyone else. Now the problem is that you traded efficiency for resilience, and you have to send order of n squared communications. So it's a lot of communications to have everyone speak to everyone. Uh, gossip is kind of in the middle. Instead of having everyone communicate to everyone, everyone communicates to one person that they choose randomly. Uh, so if you do it only once, you may not convey the information to everyone. But if you, if you repeat that process and you do it periodically, you will definitely uh, spread your information in an efficient way in n log n. It's not as good as uh, order n, but it's much better than quadratically like broadcast. Uh, so, and the good thing with this is that the malicious nodes cannot always be in between 
honest nodes. So honest nodes will eventually all learn about each other and malicious nodes can't do anything. So it's efficient and resilient. Uh, so to sum up this section, uh, gossip consists of picking a random node periodically and telling them what we know of the network uh, and it's an efficient and resilient way to share information. Uh, so that's it, we've fixed one of the four things we needed to fix. Now we need to um, record the information we've communicated so we can then interpret it and solve the problem. Uh, okay, so this one you can really not see. Um, a gossip event is a data structure that records the fact that someone communicated to me. Uh, it's got a few fields. Uh, one is the creator of this gossip event. So say if you communicate to me, I will write it down. I'll write, I'm the creator of this event. Uh, then it's got the self-parent and other parent, which are hashes of other gossip events in a way that you, it forms a graph. Uh, the self-parent is the hash of the latest gossip event I had created before. And the other parent is the hash of the gossip event the latest one you had created and that you informed me about. Uh, and then finally, there is one more field, which is the payload, which is optional. And it is, if you have observed anything, so in our example, if you want to pick one of the words from your list and put it in the gossip event, then it will be uh, something, else it will be nothing. And if it is something, the gossip event is said to be interesting. Um, so yeah, a gossip event records one instance of communication, it uh, links to parent events, and if it contains a payload, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting means that we will be interested in reaching consensus on that payload. So with these gossip events, you can build a gossip graph. Okay, so again, sorry for the, uh, it doesn't render very cleanly, but um, so each of these little circles represents a gossip event, and the line going down is their self-parent, the line coming from another node is the other parent, and then they may contain a payload or not, and uh, the creator is indicated under them. So you can build a directed acyclic graph. Uh, directed means it's always going to be in one direction. You never remove things from the graph, you only add to it. Uh, and all nodes may have a different view of this graph, but eventually, after enough time, some of it will be common. Uh, and of course, this is very hand wavy, but when we solve the problem, uh, we are more precise than this. So, with these gossip events, we built a gossip graph, it records the communications, and it will help us make the consensus problem more concrete. We are not saying anymore, let's just agree on some order of things, we are saying we have a data structure to look at, and if we can interpret it properly, uh, we can deduce consensus from it. Uh, so, time to interpret it. I'm going to define two concepts here. The first one is strongly seeing, and the second one is uh, an observer. With these two concepts, it will become easy to solve the problem, and that's where we're going. So first, strongly seeing. Uh, okay, yeah, this one doesn't show very clearly either, but it's the same graph as before. Uh, I'll tell you the formal definition of strongly seeing, and then I'll tell you a simpler definition that's a bit less correct. So the formal definition, um, gossip event strongly sees another gossip event if it sees gossip events created by a supermajority of nodes of the network that see that gossip event. No, I haven't defined seeing, so it's kind of a jump, uh, but I'll give you the intuitive, a bit simpler version. Um, a gossip event strongly sees another gossip event if that event is an ancestor of this one, and if you look at all the paths in this graph, they cover a supermajority of nodes. So here we have four nodes, a supermajority more than two-thirds is three nodes. So let's take examples and see who strongly sees what. Uh, I claim that the gossip event A1 strongly sees the gossip event B0, because if you look at all the paths and you, look, you highlight all the nodes that have created events in between these two, it covers three out of four nodes, which is a supermajority. Uh, I claim that D1 strongly sees A0 because if you look at all the paths, there is only one path, but it covers all the nodes, and more than two-thirds is always a supermajority. A2 does not strongly see A0 
because if you took look at all the paths between A2 and A0, it only covers two nodes out of four, which is less than two thirds, so it's not a super majority. So hopefully this concept of strongly seen is uh, sufficiently clear and intuitive. Uh, so that's just the hand wavy definition I gave you. And where it's hand wavy is with forks, but we're just going to go fast on this for this one. Uh, now if you remember, two supermajorities always share at least one correct node, which means that if uh, an event is strongly seen, an, a different supermajority is always going to have one honest node in common. So if someone else strongly sees an event by that node, it's going to have to be the same event, even if someone is trying to give different truth to different uh, nodes. So a bit more formally, if event X strongly sees event Y, no other event can strongly see any event by Y's creator that is on a different branch of the fork. Of a fork. So a fork is when someone tries to create a divergent, two divergent versions of reality to confuse uh, people, so it's malicious behavior. Okay, now we are going to define an observer and it's the last technical definition and then we can get to the goodies of uh, getting consensus. So I've said before, interesting events are going to be the ones that contain a payload, so they're the ones we're interested in the order of. Uh, some of the events could just record a communication and not a payload, and so we'll just ignore them for this. Uh, so here I've highlighted interesting events. They're all the oldest events from Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave. An observer is a gossip event that strongly sees gossip events created by a supermajority of nodes. So again, I'll go visual. Uh, let's ask the question, is A2 an observer? So we've already seen that A2 does not strongly see A0. So that answers one, of, uh, one part of the question. We need to see now if A2 strongly sees other interesting events. So A2 does strongly see B0, because if you trace all the paths in this graph, you can see they cover all the nodes, which is a supermajority. A2 strongly sees C0 for the same reason, and D0 for the same reason. So now, if you count the number of interesting events that are strongly seen by A2, you can see it's three out of four, which is a supermajority. So this makes A2 an observer uh, in this graph. Okay, I'm done with uh, boring definitions. So just to anchor it in your minds, an observer strongly sees a supermajority of interesting events. That's the defini definition. Uh, okay, couple of um, side points, properties of observers. An interesting event by a honest node will eventually be strongly seen by an observer. And this comes from the fact that a supermajority will eventually come back and there will be all the honest nodes if uh, the other guys try to not do anything to subvert the protocol. Um, and then, because of the other property of one honest node in common in two supermajorities, an event that is strongly seen by an observer uh, will eventually be seen by all honest nodes, and there won't be a, an alternate version of truth competing with it. Uh, so that's it. We've set the problem. Now we can solve it. Uh, and the, the key intuition behind Parsec is reducing the general agreement problem to the binary agreement problem. Uh, so the general agreement problem is the thing I've been speaking about since the beginning of this. Uh, we must all agree on the order of some arbitrary data. Uh, the binary agreement problem is a bit simpler. We must all agree on true or false. And it turns out that there is a paper from 2014 that gives a very elegant solution to binary agreement. Uh, signature free asynchronous Byzantine consensus with t lower than n divided by 3. This means less than a third malicious nodes. And order of n squared messages. So that's because they're based on broadcast. But we took the IDs, ported them to gossip, so for us it's n log n. Uh, so now, how do you go from ABFT to binary consensus? Uh, you define a meta-election where each node casts a meta vote. So it's not something they actually do, it's something you do by looking at the graphs and using the definitions we've already set. Uh, so you answer the question, does this node's interesting event uh, strongly see the interesting event, sorry, does this node's observer strongly see the interesting event proposed 
by this node for all of the nodes? Uh, and the answer to that question is a binary value. So going back to the observer we used as, as an example, uh, the meta votes of this one would be false for Alice, true for Bob, true for Carol, and true for Dave, uh, because that's the ones that it strongly sees or it doesn't. Uh, so these uh, meta votes are going to be the input to the binary agreement. So here, Alice's meta vote, because we were looking at uh, Alice's event, A2, so Alice's meta vote are going to be false, true, true, true. And with binary agreement, we can arrive at a decision on this particular question. So let's say it doesn't have to be Alice's suggestion, so let's say they decide true, true, false, true. Now, interesting uh, property you get is that um, if you reach consensus on true, it means that someone did strongly see the interesting event by this node, which means that this version of the truth will propagate to all correct nodes. So you can rely on it, you can rely on other nodes eventually learning about this. Um, okay, so because of this property, if you have, for instance, this outcome being true, 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 you can pick any rule, but let's say pick the largest of all the interesting events in the ones that got true for the meta vote. So you take Alice's interesting event, Bob's and David's, and you just take the bigger one, or take the one that has the bigger hash, or anything like this. Uh, and you are guaranteed that everyone will eventually be able to see all of these interesting events, reach the same conclusion, and reach consensus. Uh, so to sum up this part, uh, we defined a meta-election which was translating the problem of general agreement to the problem of binary agreement using the definitions that we set before. Uh, and so the question we asked was, which interesting events does this observer see? And that made it a binary problem instead of a general problem. So that's it. That's how uh, consensus is solved in Parsec. And it's all open source, so if you need a consensus algorithm, help yourselves, uh, github.com slash medsafe slash Parsec. Uh, now, what does this give us, uh, and going back to the context of blockchain? Uh, well, we don't burn energy for the sake of it. All of this is purely based on mathematics and not on uh, probability and uh, hash power. Uh, the bandwidth is virtually illimited. Actually, it's limited by how much memory you have to hold things. Uh, but that can grow pretty easily. Uh, because given a certain amount of gossip, if you gossip, for instance, every 10 seconds or every 5 seconds or whatever, you can put as many observations as you want and it won't change the complexity of the algorithm. Uh, decisions are final and that's mathematically proven. So I haven't been over the proofs, but we have them in the white paper. Uh, and know that we are not solving civil resilience, which could be seen as a drawback, well, it lets us use civil resilience as a mechanism to provide actual value to the network, not simply burn energy and the value is the security. So in the case of the safe network, we want to store data. And so we can say, if nodes have stored sufficiently, uh, a sufficient amount of data, if they've been responsive, they have invested effort into the network. And so we can make them part of the consensus group uh, and that way, instead of having an arbitrary proof of work, which is let's waste energy and see who deserves to uh, mine a block, now we can say let's uh, be useful and see who deserves to take part in the consensus decisions. So to recap kind of the entire talk, uh, blockchain at a high level technically is civil resilience and consensus. And for the consensus bit, we can do much better. So let's not stay stuck at blockchain forever. Let's keep innovating and improve on everything. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. So um, any questions? Yeah? OK. In English, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I will try. Uh, so how I can see from your presentation, um, we going away from uh, some calculate uh, from hash, yes, but we need to calculate a supermajority. 
and uh, the, is the first uh, question how time it um, yeah. yeah so and uh, another question it's um, mm, what about uh, transaction time okay. so yes it's uh, more faster than now or it's yeah it's faster okay so I'll first answer your first question I guess uh, so you. calculating a supermajority is not hard you know how many nodes are participating in consensus right now and you just need to see more than two-thirds of that so it's one mathematical operation we also calculate hashes everywhere but the difference is that in proof of work you don't just calculate hashes you um, put some random data and try to generate a hash that has enough leading zeros so you actually on purpose try to pessimize it to make it hard to uh, just like subvert the network so for us it's just hash calculations it has a cost but it's not uh, by design hindering the thing so it's much more efficient uh, for your second question about the time so because of the way gossip works it will take about log n communications from other people to me before I am uh, guaranteed, so that's the expected, uh, before I'm guaranteed to see everything. And all that we do in the way we define consensus is constant in the number of communications, so we actually reach consensus in log n uh, things. So for instance, if you had 10,000 nodes, um, actually I shouldn't have one, two, three, four. Yeah, okay, so that, well, and that's log in base 10. So in base 10, it would be four, but actually it's lo log in base two anyway. These are constants, but just to say it's going to reduce it dramatically. To say uh, it's going to be tens of, for like tens of thousands of nodes, it's going to be low number of tens of uh, communications before you can reach consensus. So it's very efficient. Will uh, this approach uh, work uh, in case of uh, network partitioning, when network uh, are split in two or three parts? Uh, Temporarily, for sure. On purpose or not on purpose? Uh, um, okay, so that in, pur in purpose. So, for instance, in our case, uh, in the safe network, we are not doing this on all the nodes in the network. We are already doing something that's yes. akin to sharding, where we're just looking at sections yes. of the network. Because there is no majority. Uh, in th parts. But then you're looking at a supermajority of the participants in the consensus. So you'd have all these parallel consensus things happening. Yes. Now, if the question is, can yes. malicious nodes partition the network? Partition network uh, in uh, a malicious case. So it's going to be much harder because of gossip, because they don't control who picks whom to gossip to. So it's uh, much harder. I'm not saying it's fully impossible. You could physically sever the cable under the Atlantic and try to like uh, partition US and Europe, for instance. Uh, so physically, you could partition a network. But the protocol is very resilient to it. Fork, fork is uh, not uh, impossible. If, if you did it, you would uh, break the protocol. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I guess following the uh, previous question, how do you see an ideal future of updating the blockchain system? Uh, so now it's uh, kind of uh, predicated on the opinion of core developers of any particular system. Uh, what do you think is ideal state of updating? How is it going to be done in the future? Um, you, uh, do you mean going from blockchain to other IDs or? Uh, I mean managing forks. Okay, so specifically updates. Um, well, I can't say for blockchains or anything. I can say some of the IDs we have. Uh, so, but okay, that probably requires a bit more background. So in the safe network, you can store data and we kind of guarantee that it will be immutable. So you look you find data in the network by looking at its hash and so the data could be um, it could be where the the code is and you could have um, so you could store the code for the next version on the network and then uh, have people install the new version of the software and that would point at the next version of the code but of course at the time of transition you need for everyone to be able to communicate and so if you want for these kind of like supermajorities and everything to work, 
you need at least to have both versions supported and probably a bit more, but let's say the very minimum is the current version and the next version must be interoperable so that you can say, okay, everyone, we can talk both. And when we have enough nodes moved over to the next one, then we can drop the old one. That's the minimum requirement. There are more requirements and it's actually a pretty uh, complicated question to answer. Uh, if you check our forum, we have long, lengthy discussions about it and uh, kind of ideas. Okay, last question, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, ecological impact of uh, blockchain algorithms. So could you please uh, point to some researches or studies regarding uh, how to find uh, less impact on the ecology, so algorithm which consume less energy, so we don't get in trap like with, with, with Bitcoin, which consumes like tremendous amount of yes. electricity. Uh, do we have future with blockchain technology? Where can we be like ecologically safe? If you wanted to stick to blockchain and try to get uh, ecological safety, I think anyway you need to get away from proof of work. Uh, sorry, not ecological safety, but like make sense ecologically. Uh, I, I don't have like papers to link to you on the top of my mind right now, but uh, this is an alternative, at least for the consensus bit. Uh, and there is other things. You could do things like proof of stake, and in general there is some form of consensus algorithm in there, uh, but generally not as good as this one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So... Pierre from London, let's provide him some applauses. <laughs> Thank you.